Hey everybody, Future Ian here. I just wanted to hop in before we get started for a quick content warning. The game we will be discussing today, Necrobiotic, has some integrated aspects of body horror, and as such we will be discussing some of these aspects throughout the episode, including in the Weird Bug Generation section at the end, where we end up getting a little bit sophomore with our humor. But, with that out of the way, let's get on with the show. Welcome to Under Common Taste. This is a podcast where we create and discuss homebrew content for tabletop RPGs. By the late 21st century, our time, a mythic time, we were all chimeras, theorized and fabricated with bits of machine and synthesized organics. In short, we were cyborgs. I'm Ian Woodworth, and I'm joined by my co-host James Daly. Today we have another special guest on to discuss their successfully kickstarted game, Necrobiotic. Mitchell Wallace. Mitch, welcome to Undercommon Taste. Hey, thanks for welcoming me. I'm super excited to be here. We're excited to have you. Yeah, we're excited to have you. Yeah, definitely. This definitely looks really interesting. Ian had sent me the information for this kind of going over it. And this is not just your standard D20 system or anything like that. You've actually looks like you've got a fun story here. So yeah, I was actually really interested to dig into this when, when I first saw it. Yeah, we try to make it interesting and new and something definitely people can kind of look back on and be like, huh, that was neat. Yeah, I, I run our Twitter account, and I still vividly remember the first self-promo Saturday when you linked that on our post, and I'm like, oh, oh. this looks cool. Oh, God, that, that animated gift, yeah. Uh, cover. Yeah, that, yeah. It, just, oh. it just pulls you in, and you're like, I have to know what this is about. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, that's one of the best things that came from this game. <laughs> just that yeah. little gift. That goes a long way. If you're out there like making your own game or you're wanting to push your own Kickstarter or whatever, find someone, pay a little extra art with the game, with the cover, with your ads, whatever. Just a good 30-second GIF, good cover art, whatever it is. Art goes so far into selling your product and getting just general interest in. Yeah, I can't say how many of our guests said, hey, you know, I like tabletop gaming. I got into D&D tabletop gaming because of the art in the books. I wanted to see the monsters and, hey, this looked interesting. So, I mean, that in itself is a huge thing just on its own. Yeah, like not much captures, like, you know, there's a lot of TTRPGs out there that were kind of in like the booming period. And like the art is your first impression on what your game is about. And it's kind of like, it's there to pull you in. So, you know, people judge books by their the covers all the time. And uh, yeah, that, that works out right. So let's go ahead and start off with a little bit of introduction. Tell us a little bit about who you are, what you do, or what's your bank account number, you know, whatever you feel comfortable with. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, I mean... <laughs> <laughs> it's a Swedish account, so... Mm -mm. Yeah, so I'm the chief creative director over at Penny Fertel LLC, which not only published Necrobiotic, but also has two Twitch streams. So we do a lot of indie TTRPG content, sponsored content for the most part. We also sell at conventions, different things like Gen Con Packs Unplugged. I also act as marketing director for Helm Gas, uh, which produces Cult Divinity Lost, Black Void Game, which produces Black Voids, and Total Party Kill Games, which is a new recent job I just got selling a lot of like 5e indie content for them so yeah like my focus has always been marketing and getting stuff out uh, I've done some writing for like Shadows of Resolve, Fragged Empire, Symbarum for their uh, writing contest I also did art direction for Flames of Freedom most recently uh, and I'm currently working on a TTRPG another Kickstarter coming out October which is kind of a uh, comedic detective TTRPG based on a New York best-selling uh, comic book. So all this stuff is kind of like... I adapt. Yeah, I was going to say, that sounds like a really super full plate. That's a lot of plates to keep spinning. Well done. <laughs> yeah. I feel like sometimes you get hit in the face. <laughs> we, don't, we don't have any idea what that feels like. No, nothing. No. no. Yeah. And so, Mitch, for the people listening who may not know, what is Necrobiotic? 
Yeah, Necrobiotic is a dystopian melancholy TTRPG based in 2100 Florence, Italy, where humanity has shrank to just a couple of thousand individuals living in Florence, and they only are able to because of their reliance upon the dead as manual labor, what we call constructs. And so they sweep the streets, they act as servers and waiters, they farm, all that stuff. And so in this world where human life is kind of the most rare and most beautiful thing you have the dead are a commodity and yeah it uses deck building mechanics so your cards your deck is your character sheet in every way and yeah it's just a a beautiful game i noticed that whenever i was reading through your quick start guide so why did you decide to go with cards instead of using a dice system yeah so one of the cooler things about the card system is that it's kind of reminiscent of the concept of spoons when you wake up and you can kind of understand like what sort of activities you're able to do today whether it's going to be like a high social day or a physical day uh, just what do you have within you to do that day and accomplish and there's something that i liked about because we didn't want it to be just a random thing we wanted it to be more of a conversation about what's important to you and what do you want to succeed at. So whenever a play comes where you're trying to figure out, you know, whether or not you succeed or accomplish something, it's not a random roll of the die. Instead, it's looking at the hand of cards that you have and do you have the resources to pay the cost in order to succeed? And then as you go through the day, making decisions on what is most important to you because you can't just keep doing stuff all day, eventually you're going to run out of spoons and enthusiasm in order to accomplish these tasks. And then it becomes more random. And so, yeah, it's kind of that resource management aspect that we really enjoyed when we were creating it. I really like that. That's a great concept for resource management. And so going through, I'm assuming that you refresh your hand every time you do a short or long rest or something along those lines, correct? Yeah, yeah. We call it a breath. So whenever you have an opportunity to relax a little bit and take a breather, uh, yeah, you refresh your hand up to the hand size so you can check out, you know, what can you do for the next couple hours. Gotcha. I love the concept of using spoon theory Mm -hmm. as a basis for a game mechanic. Yeah, that's a wonderful idea. Yeah, like it it works really well. And I think one of the really cool aspects of it too is that with the way that decks are built, you're going to have some cards in your weakest stat anyway. Like it's just kind of the basis of it. So even like your hard-nosed, antisocial, muscle-bound fighter type character, they're at least going to be successful every now and then a guaranteed success in a social or a mental thing so it kind of gives a more nuanced character in my opinion so that you aren't like just a muscle meathead or you're not someone who is just smart like you can at times be pretty athletic when it's very important to you and you're willing to play those resources in your hand i like that it's rare for you but you know if you want to do it you can do it Now, going through, it looks like we're just using a standard 52 playing card deck for this, right? Yeah, when you build your deck, it's going to be from that standard deck. So at character creation, you're probably looking at a deck size between 21 to about 24. And then that becomes your character. From then on, you just put it in like a little box. And uh, when you level up, you can add cards, change how some cards work, delete cards from your deck. Uh, in order to kind of have a higher chance of doing things. But yeah, there's a lot of customization and strategy on like how you want to make your deck, which becomes like this really cool reflection of your character. So how do you decide which cards of which suit go into your deck? And I, I guess I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. Can you give a brief explanation of what the different suits are and how they function? Yeah, definitely. The different suits and stuff are are just a reflection of of what you have in a a usual deck. So hearts are what we call flesh. They are your social stats. So you have certain skills within it that are based off of that. Steel or diamonds are your physical. Clubs or steam uh, are your mental. And then the final one, spades, are kind of what makes you unique, are, are joker classes or archetypes as we call them. And so each one are based off of those suits. So when you're building your deck, you're looking at how many points you have in hearts or your social category. And you're going from the lowest value, which is ace, ace equals a one in this game, all the way up to that value. And that kind of starts as the foundation of your character sheet. For instance, if you have a three in hearts or flesh, you're going to have an ace of hearts, a two of hearts, and a three of hearts. 
And then you just do that for every character stat. And yeah, that's kind of the basis of your character deck are these four stats. Now, of course, we have more stuff to add, like the Joker is always added to the deck, and that's kind of your critical success, your always going to be successful card. You have your Jack and your Queen, which are special abilities that you can add to your deck. Uh, and then your King is your flaw. And these things can be added to your deck and kind of represent other cards. So yeah, yeah just from that, you, you kind of make your deck and you're, you're good to play. Yeah, no, that sounds really cool. And I like that, you know, just your standard deck of playing cards is super accessible. Yeah, like everyone can get like, you know, a bicycle deck of cards and stuff. And I think you can get it for like less than a dollar or something. Yeah, because if you're newer to a game and it's your first time at like a D20 type game or something like that, it can be hard to find Mm -hmm. some of those dice if you're brand, brand new into TTRPG. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And it's intimidating. Uh, I mean, it it's intimidating be. to sit down at a table your first time and you see all of these weird shaped dice and you're like, okay, what do I do with these now? I know what the cube one yeah. does. Yeah. Oh yeah. I don't know how many times someone's like throughout the whole game. They're like, is this the D8? Is this the D6? Yeah. And stuff like that. And like, obviously, you know, we love them and this is awesome, but it's also you feel for them because it's kind of difficult to always be asking that during a game and so you know everyone i think has a general familiarity with a deck of cards just because it's so prominent in just kind of most cultures yeah at least you know what the suits are and such so i do have to ask why florence yeah so italy particularly florence has this very beautiful quality of having buildings and architecture that stretches over a significant time and i really enjoyed the fact that you know you can have like this noir uh almost dystopian melancholy setting and look at like buildings that were constructed 100 years ago as well as buildings that only been constructed like 10 years ago in kind of the same viewpoint the old cathedrals the old rooftops and stuff like that the very uh claustrophobic streets it just kind of enforced i guess the micro level of play we were hoping for necrobiotic Yeah, no, I was actually kind of interested when I saw that you had set your game in Florence because, again, you do get very obviously it's got loads of medieval history with it. But you can go back and other games have touched in on that. I believe the second Assassin's Creed was largely in Florence. Uh, Leonardo da Vinci from Florence. I can't remember the author's first name, but Harris, he wrote the Hannibal Lecter books, Mm -hmm. Red Dragon, Silence of the Lambs, all of those. Mm -hmm. And that was one of Hannibal Lecter's things when you read the books is he would draw pictures of landscapes of Florence from memory while he was in prison. He had nothing else to do. And it was kind of showing how his mind and his memory worked. So Florence is always kind of like this, again, a ton of history always kind of in that mythical surreal very ancient very modern at the same time yeah like it's just gorgeous and you know every little street just kind of hints at history that you know you could always speculate on and and wonder how life was back then which i I think looking back uh is another kind of aspect of the game when humanity wasn't whimpering forward and people still existed that said giving the feel you've developed and talking about florence and things like that and the mm-hmm. fact this is done with the deck, this would definitely be an absolute homebrew rule. But I think it would be rather amazing trying to play this game with a tarot deck. Yeah, so actually uh, we had that as a kickstart stretch goal. So we will have rules for the tarot deck oh, and, and how to awesome. in play. And we'll actually have two different rules, one of which is just like a straight conversion if you just want to use it with normal play. And the other actually follows a particular archetype that we have called Children of the River. And yeah, they specifically use the tarot deck in interesting and new ways that are kind of separate from what we normally do with the cards. So it's kind of one of like a very special class to play with. That's really cool. And that kind of goes back to originally the tarot deck were playing cards. So that's kind of an awesome (laughs) throwback to some history. So yeah, and we've had a couple of streams with tarot decks and they're so fun. I actually, I think I like them more, especially with the face cards can be just converted into the major arcana and the major arcana, like really have like really cool stories with each one uh, more and more depth in what they mean. So going through and reading your quick start and your synopsis of the game, I noticed this mm-hmm. kind of has a very Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, Days of Future Past, Deuce Ex Machina game series. Has any yeah. of these inspired you when you were building these or where were you picking your inspiration source from? Yeah, so uh, actually the biggest inspiration from this comes from the Italian novels called El Indonagio, which is done by Andrea Marmugi, who's an Italian author. And so he 
has, I think, about four to five novels, which are the basis for this setting. And Andrea as well as, sorry, Valerio was the author of it. Uh, not Andrea. Andrea is another individual from Florence who uh, definitely helped uh, kind of conceive this idea and build it and such. But yeah, it was based on those novels, which are the foundation of the setting where this world here in Florence where humanity is, is whimpering on and constructs serve as manual labor and that series actually has completed its arc and i haven't gotten to read all of them but one of the cooler things is that with this ttrpg like there's a meta plot going on that is going to be concluded at one point in the future as we continue publishing more like expansions and stuff for the game so yeah it's just kind of the basis definitely on that novel and definitely like games you know deus ex machina uh being human uh i think is a video game that kind of has some stuff uh repo the genetic opera oh I love uh, that. definitely yeah another another beautiful theme to it where just kind of like your body parts and organs are just like things for people to use so does hydrate and frat come in a little glass vial <laughs> a little glass vial <laughs> <laughs> so the mechanics for your system is all based on this mechanic of successes, Mm -hmm. which from what I understand is accruing a certain value with your cards whenever you're, whenever you're playing. Can you explain a little bit about how that works? Yeah, of course. There's two ways to accumulate successes. The first way is via a suit success, which is, you know, if you're trying to be social and you have a heart, then you're automatically going to get a success no matter the value of that card. That is a guaranteed success. The other one is getting a numeric eight or higher with a combination of cards. And so either two lends you to uh, providing a success. So Someone who's really good at social would most likely have a heart card. So they just play that to get one or however many successes they want. While someone who's not good at social could use like their club cards, a four and uh, another, maybe a four of hearts and a four of diamonds to then get that eight, which that's a success. So kind of these two ways, how you kind of approach certain things in the game which is really cool. And the kind of ability of whether or not your skill is trained or not uh, allows you to play more cards. So if you're not trained in it, you can only play one card. If you are trained in it, then you can play two cards. Um, So you kind of have some strategy with that. Okay. So you can't just throw like your hole down at once and say, hey, look, I win. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, exactly. You kind of have to, yeah, if you're trained in it, then you, you have more flexibility. Even you can just combine cards of things that you yourself are good at. You know, if you're not very social, you can combine your physical cards to get that eight, which will get you a success. It takes more effort for you to get there, but you can still do it. And going back to where you were referencing earlier, spoon theory, mm-hmm. you're spending more spoons to get your desired outcome. Yeah. Yeah, no, that. Yeah, and it it actually works very well. It really does. That's actually very inspired. I like that a lot. Yeah, I really love it. And and for, you know, the the people doing it, it's like this strategy of like, do you want to exert all those resources or do you want to save it for later for a possible other check that might be more important? And so, yeah, it's just, uh, I I find that there's more kind of strategy and thinking that goes on to what's important to your character and, and what do you want to succeed on on a daily basis. And then, you know, do you want to even pursue this check? Because if you use up a resource, you might not be able to get that back before you're the next thing you need to do instead of like usually D20 systems. Uh, and I love D20 systems. They're, they're really fun. But usually you're, you're kind of, there's no consequence for you rolling. You just kind of do it and see what happens. But yeah, it's, it's just really fun. <laughs> so would you say this game is more RP orientated or more combat orientated? Uh, definitely RP orientated. There is a pretty cool combat system where uh, you kind of take turns between the bad guys and the good guys or the bad guys and your characters or your players. So when you're fighting something, uh, you're dealt out consequences equal to like the health points or trauma okay. for the NPC. So as you wither them down every turn, they deal out less consequences. So it's just kind of this very like back and forth exchangement of resources and trying to do all these tactical things because there's a lot of stuff you can do with your successes in combat, which is also really fun. Uh, there's, there's just a lot of like, and <laughs> I, I keep saying it's, it's cool and everything, but like uh, just 
the amount of work everyone and the whole team did to bring it to life, like, it's just really cool. No, I really like this because, again, it's not just your everyday D20. So, I mean, you guys have come from a completely different angle. So, yeah, there's a lot of work that you can tell you guys have put into this. Mm -hmm. um, it looks like you've rounded it out fairly well. Like I said, it's easy to kind of just do a cookie cutter D20 game and, okay, roll D20, okay, plus or minus one, you know, whatever. But this mm -hmm. is definitely something from a different angle, so it, it's kind of refreshing. Yeah, it's new, it's interesting, and we call it the gear system, and there's definitely more stuff we want to do with it in the future beyond, like, necrobiotic. But yeah, it's just like, I've always been a huge fan of cards, and so anytime I can use it, I love it. And so I'm glad we were able to kind of implement them with this rules in this world. Yeah, and it does feel more like a game kind of like Fiasco, mm -hmm. where you have that pool that you're pulling from, and you're doing more of a narrative storytelling sort of thing than something like Dungeons and Dragons, where, I mean, at its conception in OD&D, it was a war game. It mm. started as a war game that they started role playing in. And so that still carries through into fifth edition. Fifth edition is just a glorified fantasy combat simulator. Yeah, like that has some role play aspects tacked onto it. And so this really does have that RP feel to it. Yeah, and like it, when you read the book and such, you're going to find that like a lot of the rules are focused around everything else instead of like combat and such. And so the majority of the book are just kind of these stories and just the world and how to run the game and such. And the rules are kind of a very small aspect of the book just because they're as nice and leveled as they are. They're pretty easy to communicate. And that's always nice to not have to have, you know, 80 pages of rules that you have to go mm -hmm. through in order to figure out exactly how to play a game. Yeah, that can dissuade a lot of people, unfortunately. Yeah, we wanted to keep it easy, especially like there's always that difficulty of people looking at games from a perspective and then finding it difficult to then be like, okay, how do I use these cards? Because I'm used to playing in a certain way. So the easier we can kind of communicate that, the better. So going through, we're talking about since we have said mm -hmm. that this game is really RP focused, which is great. Mm -hmm. And we've got these construct things are basically these living reanimated puppets of, of human flesh, more or yeah. less. So how much interaction will our players have with these? Are they basically like just mindless drones doing simple tasks? Or do they have like old memories and personalities left kind of like Blade Runner would? Or are they kind of like holding a range like the synths from the Alien series? Yeah, so one of the unique things about Necrobiotic is we write it from a perspective of two individuals within the setting as they kind of communicate the world to you via discussion. And because of that, we let people know that this is an unreliable narrator. Both of these individuals are. And so while they will tell you in the book that constructs are not sentient, there's no life within them whatsoever, we will definitely have some clues in the book that say like, well, maybe they aren't, and maybe, like, humanity is doing, like, this horrendous thing to the dead and to these people, all for the effort of continuing humanity. It's that lie you have to tell yourself to sleep at night? Yeah, exactly. And, like, there's some people in the government who know that it is possible, and there's some who don't. And kind of part of the story is figuring out where do your morals lie and what do you need to do to keep humanity going. One of the stretch goals that we got during the Kickstarter was the ability to use the construct template. So if your character dies, having the ability to play a construct and have that very difficult role-playing moment where you're like, I don't know. And obviously, if someone finds out what you are, you won't be alive for very long. Or at least you'll probably be studied and taken away. But yeah, it's just, it, and we do say in the book, like, it's rare. It doesn't happen often. But if you want to play with these themes and be a construct, this is the way. Yeah, that was actually going to lead into my next question. Are the players mm -hmm. playing as a human character or are they playing like a construct? And if they're a construct, do they know they're a construct? You know, kind of, yeah. again, referencing that whole Blade Runner feel with mm -hmm. a lot of this or... Uh, <laughs> Altered Carbon did a lot with that too, which yeah, another great series did. to delve into. Yeah, definitely. So yeah, by default, the players are playing regular humans. But yeah, we do have the ability to play a construct. It basically changes how the way you play the game a little bit. They don't have the opportunity to breathe like humans do in order to refresh spoons because their minds work in very different ways. But yeah, you can play them. It's just very difficult. And we, we let people know like it's not something that will be seen a lot. That'd be a lot of fun. That would be a really good 
like again, if you had a table of veterans, you know, one who's played this game several times and they were good at yeah. RP, just have the DM at the beginning of the game slip one player a note. Hey, mm-hmm. you're a construct, play it, and then go with it. That'd be, oh my God. Yeah, and like there's two different type of constructs, one of which are the more human looking ones. And those were kind of built in the earlier days. And they actually discovered that this was too damaging to the human psyche to kind of see your dead grandma outside tending the garden. And so what they started doing was tanning and stretching the skin out onto the human skeletal figure. And so they construct nowadays in the setting look like these almost like leathery mannequins these horrific things but like yeah i've had games where people were constructs but they couldn't see themselves as constructs the mind just couldn't allow them to see that aspect of themselves there's a lot of amazing melancholy-esque stories that could be told in this setting and i'm pretty sure we explored a lot of them during the kickstarter and, and after now, are you familiar with the concept of the uncanny valley? Because that's kind of what this sounds like it's touching yes. on. Yes, there we go. I was wondering if you were going to touch on that or not. Yeah, like, I think it's definitely, that is something definitely encourage people to explore while they play. Because, yeah, it's creepy. It's weird. And seeing, you know, these faces that you've kind of grown to love in this type of dead way, it's Wow, it's very troubling. I mean, everything's just a little off. Yeah, no, that's a that's yeah. a wonderful thing to explore. Well done. Mm-hmm. So with these, well, for lack of a better term, Gen 2 constructs, mm-hmm. do they still have enough of the aspects left to them to where if someone knew that person in life, they would still recognize them? Or, or have they been homogenized enough to where they're, they're pretty standard? Yeah, they're pretty standard. It's very hard to tell. And even when they're creating them, they kind of do their best to keep a certain level of anonymity just because, you know, people's attachment and such to uh, dead people, people that they loved. But that also creates a circumstance where anyone, any construct could be like your wife or your child or whoever died, someone that you cared for. So that in of itself kind of has a different consequence for humanity. No. I don't think I'm giving away too much because, again, we read your quick start guide and we read your rules. Yeah, yeah. Part of the things was the rules of the society now is that it literally says that all bodies belong to the Citadel that weren't butchered. So could you see like maybe like an aristocrat or maybe someone who was very, what's the word I'm looking for? Not a Puritan, but very Mm -hmm. kind of like against not thinking they're doing the right thing. Yeah, like... uh... Maybe their suicide is to mutilate their body in their suicide so they can't be recycled. Yeah, that aspect of like society where like respect for the dead kind of trumps, I guess, life in a certain way, that definitely still persists. And even the children of the river believe that the creation of constructs is like a horrendous thing that humanity is doing and needs to stop. And so every now and then they'll try to kind of hide bodies or mutilate them in a way so that they can't be brought back. But yeah, that sort of thing in terms, I guess, from the government's perspective, it's like a huge sin, like uh, it's very much against the law. Once you die, your body belongs to the government. Uh, There's nothing you can do about it. So no wood chippers or incinerators for you, huh? Exactly. (laughs) Yeah, nothing. It doesn't matter. Like your body's the government's. You're going to be working after you die and several years after. (laughs) Yeah, I'm definitely getting an altered carbon feel from this, which I love that series. And that was, you know, you had, I don't think they were Catholics, but you had the groups where they thought that the implants were. were. Yeah, yeah, I think they were. Were they Catholics? Yeah, they thought the implants were a sin and something that shouldn't be done. And they were trying to pass the laws so like a person who was murdered could come back and point out their killer. So yeah, that's... Mm -hmm. That is definitely a story you could definitely run with, which would be really interesting to do. Yeah, and like one of my favorite, uh, because the Children of the River have such a strong belief concerning it, it actually comes from the belief that their prophet spoke to a construct out in the wild who was completely sentient and remembered who they were when they were like fully alive. And so they believe that every construct has that ability. And so we're kind of enslaving the dead and keeping people conscious past the point of their death in like this horrific prison of solitude within their own mind so there's no earned rest after life <laughs> exactly like it's just like they believe humanity's doing a horrific thing here and they gotta stop so is it more of a philosophical thing where they're dead we should leave them dead or is it more of a metaphysical thing where they're dead but their soul is trapped in here and their soul can't pass oh on? i didn't even think of a metaphor oh wow yeah it's yeah. definitely like the soul or the mind and that kind of aspect is kind of up to each person of the children of river but it's it's that thing where like your personality and your being persists 
after death when they bring you back and they program you and you're just kind of a slave to this dead body while your mind just withers away over time within your own body because you don't have control of it anymore someone else does and you can't speak and you can't do anything you just kind of so have you ever seen that wonderful video one by metallica Oh, I feel like I have at one point in time, but I, I can't recall where it goes uh, through and it's the whole thing and it's the soldier and it goes back to like, it shows him flashbacks when he's a kid and, and learning mm -hmm. about patriotism and wanting to fight for his country. And then obviously for the song, he goes through the war and he's horribly maimed. And it shows in the movie, he's sitting there and he's batting his head and they're thinking he's like you know, having a seizure or something. And they realize he's trying to tap out Morse code with his head because that's the only way he can communicate. And he's begging for death because he's trapped in this body with his mind fully active, but he can't do anything about it. Anything. Uh, yeah, that actually, I did a scenario that was very close to that where um, they were in a coffee shop and a construct just starts crying and they couldn't figure out what was wrong until they noticed that its finger was tapping Morse code that was, you know, trying to communicate that, you know, it had some unfinished business and wanted to check on a loved one who they didn't get a chance to really say goodbye to. So yeah, it's definitely those aspects are in it. Yeah, I'm just, I'm seeing the potential for so many great stories in this. It's like, oh my God, I want to play this scenario and I want to play this scenario and I definitely got to do this. So if we're doing all these scenarios and atmospheres, how would you set up? And apparently you've done some play tests, which is really cool on Twitch, which I need to go see. Oh yeah, I think I was averaging around four to five actual plays every week during the Kickstarter. Oh wow. But what kind yeah, of like, I don't know, what kind of ambience would you set? Like food, lighting, music? What would you set up for your players to kind of get them in the right mood? Yeah, one of my favorite things to do when I first bring someone into it is I just ask kind of what their favorite food is. And then the first location is usually like the place that they eat at. And of course, because the world is different, uh, what was normally like a very normal thing becomes this twisted, dark thing that kind of freaks you out at times. Uh, one of my favorites is like a coffee shop. But, you know, instead of the baristas and stuff like that, you have a construct with their chest cavity carved out with a boiler plate like in their chest that keeps the crop warm with this coffee. And so whenever you want coffee, you just raise their hand and it moves forward like this mechanical doll takes this carafe out of its chest and pours you coffee and then heads back to the corner and just sits there and watches you drink and the same thing for like food or you know all sorts of things constructs are versatile and are kind of tailored for the job that they're for and so you can have all these very like dark horrific moments even like carriages because cars aren't really a thing anymore carriages are like these construct horses with like their back half carved out in order to make room for seats and like there's these skeletal horses and oxen pulling these carriages in order to transport people so you kind of start shedding light on like the twisted normality of the world as you start playing and it's, it's always been really cool to see people's reaction as like gross as it is to hear but you know you tell them like this is now the new norm yeah, I would totally like with the coffee shop thing, like the craft thing would be a little unnerving. I think more it'd be weird that the waiter just kind of goes in a corner and stares at you waiting for you to do yeah. something. Like, stop staring <laughs> just, at me. <laughs> yeah, it's just like, uh, <laughs> uh, it's just like, you know, you have this atomic, almost robot-esque creature that just. Yeah, but I mean, if you're living in this setting, your character would have probably been kind of yeah, numbed, like numbed to this whole thing because it has become the norm. Yeah, like it's just like this very unique and beautiful thing where the players are freaking out, but their characters are just like, I guess this is normal. Uh, I it's think, Tuesday. <laughs> yeah, like, you know, I got my coffee and uh, I guess I'll go to work after this. But yeah, and I, I think how I always try to present the material is that while this is the norm, there's still kind of a cost to it. And I feel like there's always a sense of melancholy or uh, pressure just from how society and humanity is and what people have to do on a day-to-day -day basis to keep humanity going. Like love, hope, and beauty are, are a rarity. Uh, and so some scenarios, we kind of go through those themes, like, you know, what do you do uh, in order to find love? And uh, what do you do to kind of preserve beauty and the, the gorgeous things in life that kind of we all take for granted? I like that. Yeah, it's one of my favorite aspects. So I had a question on my list that the more I listen to you, the more I think it's been answered. Yeah. <laughs> but is this setting intended to be hopeful or grim? <laughs> so it definitely lends itself to the grim side. But what I try to do is that, in my opinion, like the more beautiful a moment is uh, becomes 
even more so by the stark comparison of despair and bleakness. You know, the sun is brightest after uh, the night. And that's kind of how I, I like to do it is there are some horrific and a lot of despair and darkness in the world, but like you have these beautiful moments. In that same scenario where that construct was crying and giving this Morse code about this desire to uh, have this unfinished business being taken care of before, like they drifted back to the darkness of their form. They were actually just trying to deliver these letters that never got to that construct's daughter who ended up growing up without their mom. And the end of the scenario just had them finally deliver all these letters that she always wanted for her daughter to know, like, you know, that she loves her and and wanted to be there for her when she was alive but was unable to. And so, yeah, you kind of have those melancholy moments, but also those, those moments of beauty where you're like, yeah. That is a wonderful balance to strike. Yeah, that's what I always try to do. Because while I do love horror and just kind of like Cult Divinity Lost is one of my favorite games. And it's just like horror and despair and darkness all over. uh, I wanted to make sure like this game didn't go that road. It had its dark moments, but also like a presence of beauty within the story. uh, That was important. And I also think the art captures that pretty well. Yeah, I have to agree on that point, that the art really does evoke that sort of feel. You know, there's a lot of the art that is, that I've seen anyway, that is very grim, very grungy. It gets that feel that, you know, the world has gone to shit. Yes. Yeah. But but there are those rare images like the one that you have on the cover. Yeah. You know, it is a still of that gift that you used for your promotions that it just, it's haunting. Yeah. That's, that's the only real word for it. So, yeah, talking about... Yeah, was, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, no I, was just, I was super proud of the <laughs> artist. Like, really. Like, it took me a long time to find the perfect artist. And she continues to astound me with the amazing things she's done. So, yeah, it's always been really cool. <laughs> I'm also excited to see what more she does. Because, yeah, there'll be more art. So, it's cool stuff. So, yeah, talking about the art and the way it looked. And, again, you had that, like, that grim, dusky dark... And again, the location of Florence is absolutely just a great way to do. It's something that's not overdone. But again, you have that good merging of the ancient and the, the, the new and the old kind of going together. I was thinking, though, along the same lines, if you did another module, London, something like Sweeney Todd, because the art kind of had that Sweeney Todd yeah. feel to it. And again, that Victorian, dusky, definitely run down, uh, sure division of the haves and have nots. You still got your river through there. I almost got a very Sherlock Holmes feel when I was first seeing the art. And then I saw Florence. I was like, oh, okay. (laughs) Yeah, like, we're really excited. And one of the cooler things is that in later supplements, we will have access to other cities. And you kind of get to see how other cities have dealt with death, which is going to be different from how Florence did it, which is going to be a lot of fun to explore. I can definitely see something like this in someplace like new orleans as well Mm -hmm. oh my god that'd be amazing holy crap yeah that'd be so cool (laughs) oh my god yes please please write the module now just yeah (laughs) yeah i'll be taking notes i'll give you that one for free (laughs) yeah we'll make sure to credit you be like new orleans it was them oh that's dope like that that would be really cool and yeah we, we definitely have plans to expand and because right now in the setting, like the people of Florence don't really know that there are potentially other people out there uh, who have also survived in their civilization. So Okay. So going through, if you could get this game into anyone's hands or have any one or two people mm. sit down and play a game, who would you want to play or see this game? Uh, so I would do two, one of which for the publicity, uh, and that would be, I, I always imagine Danny DeVito of playing the game. <laughs> that would be awesome, okay. <laughs> which which would just be amazing and fun, uh, and I would love to see what he would do with it. The other might one I, would... Uh, might I offer you a construct in this trying time? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> like, seeing him going around as, like, a militia member uh, would, would just... it would uh, I would smile uh, so much. Uh, on a more serious note, I think the actor who played the old guy in The Mandalorian, uh, the the one with the scar, was always like, "Give me the baby." Oh, Werner uh, Herzog. Yeah, nice. I think he would be great for the game. So yeah, well, he, he's he's very nihilistic to begin with. So yeah, I could definitely see him. Yeah, I could just imagine this. the <laughs> what he would bring to a table and having everyone just kind of like, I don't know if we can match this. 
Oh, I don't know as if anyone would actually survive long enough to get out of the coffee shop. <laughs> yeah. <I'm> like, <laughs> what the heck is this? <laughs> yeah, so that would be amazing. I though uh, if I had to pick someone from like the TTRPG community, I think for me it would probably be Darcy Ross from Monty Cook Games or, or who formerly was a part of Monty Cook Games. Yeah, I, I think that would that would be the person. Okay. That's what I always looked up to. I'm out of questions. James, you got any more questions? Yeah, actually, I kind of, as we're talking about this, again, just trying to get to know you yeah. as a creator and a person. What's your thoughts on the uh, human cybernetic singularity? The, oh, so you, you, you oh, what, what do you mean? Because I, I have some thoughts on it, but like. Is that yeah. something you would do? So if someone walked up and said, hey, I can download you and put you in a chip and you would live forever, would you do it? Oh, that, I, I. Because a lot of my decisions I do without thinking about the repercussions, I just kind of work by instinct. I probably would say yes and then probably regret it like 200 years later. <laughs> I mean, was it Black Mirror is one of the more oh, terrifying yes. Black things. A wonderful series. Yeah, where, where they put them in, uh, what did they call it? The, um, uh, oh God, it was some like very cute name, like the Biscuit or, or something like that. Pretty much they make you into an Alexa for yourself, but you have to like serve yourself in that Black Mirror episode. And like, oh man, that, that would terrify <laughs> the hell out of me. Like, <laughs> unless I had access to Netflix and then that'd be a different story. But yeah, like I would definitely be a part of it. I just probably would regret it at one point in time. Gotcha. So are you familiar with the series of books, The Murderbot Diaries? No, I, I'm not. Okay, so the general premise, I've only gotten through the first one mm -hmm. that sort of sets up the premise for the following books. But basically, you have interplanetary travel going on, and mm -hmm. there are a series of basically security professionals that are genetically engineered human beings. They're clones that have various cybernetic upgrades installed into them. And then based on what they're going to be used for, whether, you know, just basic security guard, law enforcement, military, they have a different suite of software uploaded into them to, you know, handle different aspects. And the story follows this one. They are colloquially referred to as murder bots mm -hmm. because that's that's what they do. They're supposed to have a block that inhibits emotional responses and, you know, keeps them running on their programming. But this one in particular was on some remote location where they weren't they were kind of lenient on their upgrades and he figured out how to get in on the back end and pick and choose which pieces of software he wanted to actually upgrade on the, yeah. when, the when the upgrades pushed through and so there was this one murder bot who was self-aware who was a conscious human being and talking about the moral and ethical implications of you know their clone that was you know vat bred for this particular purpose and has the cybernetics Im implanted for this particular purpose yeah. and is property oh but they're sentient now and we know that they're sentient now so how do we do this oh yeah that yeah like i i love those stories where you're just like what the think, hell have we done? I think the first book is called All Systems Red. And I can't for the life of me remember the name of the author. But that's the first book. And if you like the Mass Effect series, it has, yes. a, very, it has a very Mass Effect feel to it. So I absolutely love I'm it. I'm going to have to go searching yeah. for Audible now. <laughs> I know, right? Like, yeah, and, and, I, and I actually did the audiobook for it. So it is oh, on cool. Audible. Oh, sorry. It is on Audible. So yeah. It was great. Oh, geez. 10 out of 10. We'll yeah, recommend. No, that's cool. I, I think the last Audible book I, I read, uh, I think was a Scanner Darkly. And if I remember correctly, it was either Danny DeVito or, or someone else in that range who, who did the Audible voice work for it. But yeah, Scanner Darkly is another one of my favorite books uh, by Philip K. Dick. And that, that whole story was just... Uh. He's a great author. I love a lot of his work. Yeah. And All Systems Red is a pretty short book. I think the audio book was only like six and a half hours. Oh, that's not bad at all. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah, it's not it's not a long book at all. That's but One Nights so of good. Insomnia. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you just... I listened to it while I was building raised beds during the pandemic, so... <laughs> Ooh. Yeah, that's fair like you know I, I love audible books and such it's just the ability to keep your mind occupied oh absolutely uh, yeah. 
Oh, it's perfect. I, I love it. Disclaimer, we are not sponsored by Audible. <laughs> yeah, but Audible, we could if you want be. To, yeah. Oh, we could be. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, uh. Uh, we we will take your money. We're not yeah. we're not too proud. <laughs> All right. So one of the things that we love to do whenever we have a guest on is run through the weird bug generator yeah. and create a monster on the fly. We've come up with some really cool stuff, some really weird stuff. So if you have your dice, yes, I do. Shaky, shaky. Then, then let's, let's go. Do it. Let's get to it. Okay, so let's start off with a D4 roll for its locomotion. All right, four. It swims. Yes. Okay. This is the first swimming one that we've had so far. We still haven't movie. gotten a two. Two is runs, and runs is in all caps. Oh, my. Ooh. It's like it follows, like this creepy, like it runs. It's going to chase yeah. after you. All right. Next up is going to be a D6 roll for what does it eat? Six. Six. It eats carrion. Ooh. All right. Yeah. I can with get the theme. That. Yeah. So we've got yeah. we've got a swimming thing. Yeah. Okay. Uh, next up is going to be a D eight for the size. Three. Three. It is the size of a pebble. <laughs> a little small, but okay. Yeah. I definitely see these as being kind of like the last batch that we did when uh, Jake Dirksen was on, where it's going to be a swarm of something. Yeah. yeah like this is piran- We're making piranhas here. Okay, yeah. yeah, but they're but they're tea tiny piranhas. Yeah. <laughs> what are those the vampire fish that'll swim up in your urethra? <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. It, it's God. that we're making the vampire fish. Like, holy hell. I was gonna go with those little fish that eat the dead skin off your feet in like the Japanese spas, but that's entirely more terrifying. <laughs> yeah, like <laughs> whatever God made that, they were they were evil as hell. <laughs> Okay, so next up is a D10 roll for the number of limbs. Six. Six? Okay, so this is insectoid, so it's got six limbs. Okay. Again, I could still see a fish like this if you count, like, the pectoral fins and whatnot. You'd have yeah. pectoral well, fins. I, I, just, and... okay. I just imagine, like, human hands sprouting from it. Okay, that that's possible, too. Yeah, these tea tiny little human hands. Yeah, like, I got human hands. Look at me, I'm a human. Who's got six thumbs and is swimming up where I shouldn't be? This guy. <laughs> like, what are you doing with those hands, little fishy? <laughs> I just want to love you. Yeah. Let me come up there, guys. All right. And then give me a D100 roll for the number of eyes. Ooh, 45. Oh, 45 eyes. Okay. That's, you know, this fine your urethra. <laughs> Obviously. At this point, it's all eyes and hands. Yeah. <laughs> It's just this thing. Oh my god! It's just this mass of eyes and hands and a mouth to shove carrion into. Mm-hmm. Mom, mom, mom. Feed me, Seymour. Feed me. <laughs> okay. Next up is a D twelve roll for its method of defense. Eight. Eight. Acid spittle. <laughs> All right. So it climbs up into uh, <laughs> an acid spittles you until you don't have it anymore. <laughs> Oh, oh god, that's terrifying. <laughs> yeah, like we're making a monster here. Okay, so this is what I'm seeing so far. Your bits, they just run off. This is what I'm seeing so far, tying in with the whole necrobiotic theme. We're going through mm-hmm. and this is like the early constructs. Maybe they were trying to get like the sewage and stuff out of the river to clean it out. Yeah. And so this thing goes, and so if it senses any kind of waste product, it swims to the source and tries to and it's just self replicated at this point where the waters are infested. Yeah, no, I, I think that's good. I remember uh, today uh, I was running a scenario and they look down into a vent and they see like this humanoid corpse without the bones of their shoulder with kind of like beard hair sewn into its flesh. And its whole purpose was just to clean the vent. So it's just kind of like a little caterpillar. This humanoid corpse like body just kind of moves about in the vents to clean it. It was a living pipe brush. That's horrifying. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yay! Yeah, definitely grim. Okay. <laughs> like imagine hearing that in your vents. You're like, ah, oh, God. Ka-tunk, ka-tunk, ka-tunk. It's like, oh, geez. Okay. Next up is going to be a D20 roll for quirks. Uh, all right. I got a 12. 12. We got these last time, too. Uh, Dodecachromats. They've got mantis shrimp eyes so they can see ultraviolet and beyond, see magical and invisible stuff. 
Ooh, so even if you're like a wizard who casts like invisible, uh, they can still find you. <laughs> <laughs> yes. yes, I'm totally getting they they see and sense by pheromones. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh god, well, it's like a chemical sensor. Yeah, you know that's yeah. They're like they're like tracking methane and stuff. Exactly. Yeah, I mean they need it if they're going to kind of explore the human body and like I feel like any orifice is kind of up for grabs. Like they might crawl into your ear. Quite literally at this point, if they got hands. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they crawl like these little hand, these humanoid hands that just crawl into your ear and spit acid into you, and you're just like, holy crap! All you hear is the sizzle. Oh mm-hmm. god! You're like, do I smell toast? So I I used to work in a welding shop in a sheet metal shop, structural welding first, and then sheet metal later, and that was the primary reason why our welding instructor in welding school told us to make sure you wear your earplugs because if you oh. have something drip. You know, slag or metal drip down and fall into your ear. He said that you can hear it sizzle until it hits bone. Oh my god! Oh, my god. oh sweet. Yeah, Jesus. that's like uh, was it Alien Two or Three, where the acid falls down from the ceiling and gets on. I think it was actually Three or maybe Resurrection. Uh, it, it gets onto the person's face and he like starts to bat at it, but it's like acid, so it's not much you can do. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now it's time to make it weird. Because it hasn't been already. (laughs) Because it hasn't been already. Give me another D100 roll. 59. 59. Can fire 2D6 barbs per day with the range as a crossbow. (laughs) Damage depending on size. Okay, so Um, I'm still getting that whole vampire fish thing where they've got the gills that flare out so they lock in place and these, they can just, they can do that or they can shoot them out defensively. Mm -hmm. I almost want these to be like harpoons yeah they're as nice. if they're attached by a filament so that they can actually pull themselves, pull themselves to out. another location okay yeah that's horrifying they're, they're just, but i like they're, they're like the face huggers they just kind of like attach themselves to them and start crawling into you oh geez oh gee yeah that's absolutely terrifying so james do you want to do a second one i'll, I'll let you do my dice are packed up currently so okay let me open up my dice roller dooby dooby doo D100, what do we get? 46. (laughs) Oh, gosh. This is also appropriate for what we've been talking about so far. Bite causes agony. Oh, God. On top of normal damage. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Well, I mean, it spits acid, so it it only makes sense. Totally makes sense. (laughs) So so can I bring in a bright ray of sunshine here with some philosophy? Okay. Yeah. There's the multiverse theory, so anything you imagine exists somewhere we just created something terrible it, it, it's it's there <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, that universe is fucked. <laughs> yeah I, I just imagine this thing is crawling through the streets slowly trying to get to us the, the yeah. beings who fought them up yes yeah oh my god so these things live in the river they swim right what if it's like yes, a, they swim. a flood so like the levee breaks or something like that now they're just in the yeah. streets and so, like, the, the waters are drying out, and they're trying to find anything, water or food or anything like that. So they're just everywhere. They're, like, getting the walls or the pools or the sewer or the, oh, the plumbing system or something like that. You turn on the tap, and yeah. they just start coming out of the oh, tap. God. Yeah. <laughs> like, we just made uh, trimmers. What, what are they on now? Like, eight? Seven? Yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. All right. So just a quick recap. This thing, it swims. It feasts on carrion. It's the size of a pebble. It has six limbs and 45 eyes. It spits acid. It has mantis shrimp eyes. And it can shoot its barbs like a crossbow. And its bite causes agony on top of normal damage. Yeah, no, that, that makes sense. So what are we calling it? Man, I'm trying to think. I, I want to throw things. Yeah, necro into it. I mean, the child in me just wants to call it the necro dick. Uh-huh. <laughs> See here, um... You got a necrophage. Uh, a biophage. Uh, bio, I mean, Mass Effect, like that's. <laughs> that, that, that'd be a good one, too. Penis Exploder. <laughs> the Dick Popper. <laughs> Dick Popper. <laughs> Dick Popper is definitely its, like, nickname. Yeah. yeah. That's what it's called on the street. What's the. Yeah. Uh, What's the Greek root for explosion or explosive or to burst? The I'm phallic, right. whatever, you know, the, the phallic boot. Yeah. Boater. Yeah, I, I looked it up and it did not help. Me. If, if you want to go full Greek, I mean, you could have the laconic, uh, the laconic or the, yeah. Laconia's Lament. Ooh, I like that. I, I definitely, or Lacuna Coil. 
I think maybe it doesn't have a name because everyone who's encountered it wasn't able to articulate <laughs> through the pain well enough to live or, or to like think. It's just I'm, bursts. I'm trying to own. think. This is probably terrible of me to bring up, probably terribly of me to say. So I'm just going to go ahead and apologize before I have time to anybody who's listening who's possibly offended. But what was it? Vaginal dentalis where they used to think there was teeth. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, in that horror movie, Teeth, like, oh, God, yes. <laughs> yeah, can we work something along those lines, Ed? I mean, we don't have to yeah. focus necessarily on the genitals, but... Um, <laughs> yeah, but I mean, yeah. I like mean, if, they... we're, if we're making this as if it were canon to necrobiotic, somebody created this. Yes. <laughs> and that's what I think is maybe... It's not operating as designed... But somebody created this, so somebody knows what this is called. Because right. somebody named it whenever they made it. And that's what I was saying, is maybe it was like a sewage and refuse. Yeah, like it unclogged toilets. Yeah. And finally it was done with your shit. Or just the, even the river, you know, trying to get the gunk out of the river to keep the water source mm-hmm. clean for people to use, like the aqueducts. Yeah, because it, it does swim, so it, it needs to be something aquatic-based. I'm thinking like the roto-rooter. Something if you're going to get the anteater or a rooter, like a pig roots. Yeah. Oh, oh maybe. These, definitely. Are, hey. So these are going to be like, uh, was it the tardigrades? Yes. Oh, yeah. Water yeah. owlbears. <laughs> Water owlbears. Necrobears. Necrograids? Necrograids. Ne- uh, Necrograid. Yeah, I like that. Uh, Necrograid. There we go. <laughs> that way we get our necro in there, yes. which was your original requirement. No, that's perfect. Yeah, necrograids. Also known as dick poppers. <laughs> <laughs> yep, yep. Uh, like, we should have warned you if you have children under like 16 or 18 listening. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Too late. Uh, They've been don't... corrupted. Dies when cast. The dick poppers are in the Rubicon. Like, beware. <laughs> the humanity has messed up. <laughs> Our bad. Sorry, not sorry. <laughs> It's game over, man. It's game over. <laughs> nuke it from oh over to Sailor Wind to be sure. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, my God. Oh. Well, that was fun. That was fun. So, as we're wrapping up, one of the things we like to ask our guests is to give a shout out to someone else in the community that they feel deserves a little bit of extra notice, a little bit of extra love. So, uh, do you have somebody, creator, an artist, a streamer, anybody that you would particularly want to shout out? Yeah, for me, definitely Amit Moshe, who is the creator of City of Mist. Like, such a a beautiful merging of, like, the aesthetic noir setting and wonderful storytelling. Like, he's always been a hero of mine in terms of TTRPG designers. So, yeah, definitely check his work out. Uh, I know he has Queers coming up, which is a TTRPG based on the Japanese uh, comic book of the same name, which is all about, like, uh, it's it's a bunch of queer uh, individuals who kind of fight crime together and stuff like that. So it's really interesting and such a beautiful story so definitely check out Amit Moshe okay awesome and real quick while we're wrapping things up what was the name of your production company again who's producing uh necrobiotic can we go ahead and give them a shout out yeah penny for a tail and where can we find you guys at yeah you can find us at just penny for it's the best place to check us out you'll be able to find information on necrobiotic as well as everything else that we're we're getting into so uh yeah that's the best place and is that we're post kickstarter is that Mm -hmm. in pre-orders now yeah, so actually tomorrow is when we are going to launch the pre-orders. It'll be the last time to get the special edition, which is a gorgeous alternate front cover. And yeah, we'll we'll have pre-orders and shirts and stuff like that available for people to purchase. Awesome. So because we're recording this a little bit ahead of time, tomorrow being uh, oh, July yeah. 12th. Yeah, okay. definitely. July, okay. July 12th. I think this episode's slated to come out on either the 21st or the 28th. So. Oh, then, yeah, it is out right now. <laughs> go check okay. it out. Yeah. <laughs> Get it right now. Just go to the Kickstarter, click on the pre-order button. It'll take you to the backer kit. You'll be able to sign up and get involved and get up to date. So uh, definitely do that. We are anticipating releasing uh, hopefully quarter four, though, you know, with shipping as it is, it might uh, take to quarter one. All that's left really is editing and layout. Uh, it's all written and ready to go. So, uh, yeah. Supply lines are kind of crazy right now. Yeah, shipping oh, is. Oh, gosh, awesome. it is. Yeah. Like, uh. Are you still doing playthroughs on Twitch as well? 
Yes, I am. Like today I was on Chasing Tales and there is a campaign that we are doing on the Black Feather Guild. So that's a great way to kind of see how a campaign could be run as well as like character progression, which is also like one of my favorite aspects of the game is the ability to customize your deck. So yeah, it's a great place to go to. All right. Well, thank you, Mitch, for coming on today. Yeah, this has been a great, great interview. Thank you, guys. Yeah, my absolute pleasure. Yeah, this, this has been amazing. Yeah, we, we've had a lot of fun today. <laughs> and we created something horrific that we're going to dream about. <laughs> yeah. and, and feel free to grab that and use it. Oh, I, I am. Like, the next time a Technophon is peeing uh, out in, in the wilderness, like, it's going to be that weird uh, that construct thing. They're going to be like, who the heck made this? <laughs> and, uh, and thank you, everyone, for listening today. If you have any comments, suggestions, or ideas for future episodes, please send us an email at undercommontaste at gmail.com or send us a direct message through our Twitter account at UCT Homebrew. I'm still doing my Shakespeare and Insult page day calendar inspired role play prompts six days a week. They go up on the Twitter account and then they get cross posted to the Instagram and Facebook accounts, which are at Undercommon Taste. We're also on Patreon, patreon.com slash Undercommon Taste. So if you want to help the show financially, please come and become a patron. Again, you can find our podcast wherever you listen to your podcast. As always, give us a rate and review. This helps increase our visibility so we can bring you more content. Thanks once again for listening to us, and we will see you next week. Happy gaming. Thank you for joining us for another episode of Undercommon Taste. If you enjoyed what you heard, please pass it along to your friends. If you have comments, suggestions, or ideas, you can email them to us at undercommontaste at gmail.com. If we like your idea, it may make it into a future episode. You can find us wherever you find your podcasts, and we would greatly appreciate any likes, ratings, and comments you could provide. Find us on social media. We're at Undercommon Taste on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube, and on Twitter at the handle at UCT Homebrew. If you would like to help support the show financially, please visit our Patreon page at patreon.com slash Undercommon Taste. Our theme is Massacre Anne, written and performed by Mary Crowell and used with permission. You can find her online at marycrowell.bandcamp.com or on Patreon at patreon.com slash Dr. Mary C. Crowell. Thanks again for listening, and stay safe. You'll hear from us again soon.